Hi everybody, uh, this is another video providing information about how to contribute to scikit-learn, in particular as part of an open source sprint. Uh, Reshma is organizing another sprint together with the Data Umbrella, this time with a geographical focus on Africa and the Middle East. We've gotten a lot of feedback on past sprints, and I'm trying to clarify some of the points that people struggled with in our past sprints in this video here. If you haven't already, uh, please check out the videos we posted before. I've given a short overview of contributing to scikit-learn, and Rashma did a whole walkthrough on creating your first pull request. If you're new to contributing to open source and or to scikit-learn, I highly recommend you check out both of them. This video here will assume that you understand the basics that we described there, and we'll discuss some of the topics in more detail. First, a word on pair programming. During a sprint, we highly encourage people to work in pairs using a process from agile development called pair programming. Pair programming is great. Pair programming is great. Uh, because it allows the participants to share knowledge and usually increases the fun of programming a, a lot. In particular, if you're new to a code base, it's common to struggle and having more eyes on the code often helps. In pair programming, you have two developers working together on the same problem, with one person driving who actually writes the code. The other person observes and discusses the programming with the person driving. Right now, you're likely not uh, in the same space as the person you're coding with, but online platforms like Discord allow you to easily share your screen and have a private audio channel. Being able to talk while typing the code is quite important for pair programming to be productive. Good pair programming depends on both people being good communicators and be patient with each other, both of which take a lot of practice. The two of you should be talking together uh, basically constantly. I could recommend that the person that's less familiar with the code base or that feels less certain about the work drives most of the time. This can be a little bit intimidating at first, but will provide a huge learning opportunity to both of you. If the more experienced person is driving, it's very easy for them to lose the other one. With the less experienced person driving, the the person driving will likely learn some programming tips from the other one, while the observer will practice explaining their ideas in detail. In other areas, you might have a complementing strength and will learn from each other. You can switch who is driving, but I wouldn't switch very often, and instead talk through any stumbling blocks together. All right, so let's say you have found a partner and you have found an issue you want to work on. If you're both new to scikit-learn, it's a good idea to get oriented a bit. I, generally, I think the conciseness of Python means it's pretty easy to manually navigate even complex code bases, but having some assistance from programming tool helps. I used to code in Vim, but these days I'm using VS Code, and I'll show you how to navigate the code base with it. You can do the same with any other IDE or editor, though. So here I open the second learn repository in VS Code, and you can see all the files and folders on the left hand side. Usually a Python project has a setup.py at the top level of the repository, which you can see here. And then there's a folder that contains the actual module, which is sklearn in this case. And all the code that is part of the library is going to be in this folder. Then there can be several other folders. Scikit-learn has become quite complex over the years, and so there are a lot of folders, and I don't want to go through all of them. Many of the files and folders actually set up various continuous integration infrastructure and automatic pipelines for release of packages. That's, for example, CircleCI and GitHub, and many of the YAML files you see down here for Travis and Azure pipelines, and so on. You're relatively unlikely uh, in a sprint to touch any of these. You're more likely to work on uh, 12 folders that are related to the uh, documentation, which is example and doc. The examples folder contains example Python scripts that are also related to the website. 
as you can see, each of these folders here has several Python files in them. And the doc folder contains the code for the website and for all of the user guide. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a bit. The tests in scikit-learn are interleaved with the code in separate test folders. So within the sklearn folder, you have a test folder here. And uh, within each of the subfolders, you have a test folder that's specific to this particular submodule. For example, if you want to work on logistic regression, logistic regression is in the sklearn uh, slash linear model folder. And so there's a file logistic here uh, that contains logistic regression and the corresponding tests will be in the linear model folder in the subfolder tests, test logistic. All right, so now let's say you uh, want to address a particular issue. For example, this one here. Um, in this issue, uh, there, um, there's a complaint about the uh, doc string. And so this is a doc string of the Kalinsky Hara score. Let's say we want to find this. The easiest way to do this is to use the search function in your editor. If your editor doesn't have a search function, you can also use git, git grab. So luckily this, this name is actually quite unique. And so the research results are pretty small. Still it helps you to understand the different folders these are the results are in. So here the doc modules, this is the uh, documentation, metrics. this is uh, the code, so it's the actual implementation, and um, then here these are tests. We can also briefly, uh, quickly find the definition by just putting def in front of it, and so now we go to the actual code. The issue was about the doc string, and the doc string is uh, part of the documentation that is with the code. So here you have the function definition, and just after the function definition, you have this string. This is what's going to be rendered in the API documentation on the website, which is uh, uh, unlike the user guide, the user guide is in the doc folder. And so now if we want to make a change, we could make the change here. Now, let's get into the documentation and website a little bit more. The documentation is generated using a tool called Sphinx and mostly written in a markup language called Restructured Text, or IST. It's not a very common language outside of the Python documentation and it needs a little bit getting used to. All the files in the documentation folder, the doc folder, are written in RST. They are parsed by the Sphinx tool, which then generates the website. Things can also generate other outputs like PDFs, but usually we mostly use the HTML output for our website. Things also reads part of the documentation that's inside the code. The doc strings that we saw are embedded with the function and class definitions. And these are then also rendered on the website. As I said before, Sphinx also reads the examples and puts them on the website. So if you want to modify the uh, part of the documentation, it's part of the doc string. As I showed you, you have to do this in the source code itself. So everything that will be rendered in the API documentation is written in the source code itself. If you want to modify the user guide, this will be written in RST inside the doc folder. The doc string has a particular format, the numpy doc format, and um, we have several other con uh, conventions ourselves. You can find all of these in the contributor guide. All right, so finally, I want to talk through two issues with Git that uh, people often struggle with. In the other videos, we already walked through the basic workflow, but uh, there are two tasks that often come up that I want to highlight. During a sprint, there can be a lot of activity on the repository, and the changes that the people make can be relevant to whatever you're working on. This might lead to conflicts or to you working on an outdated version of the code. 
Before you start anything and whenever GitHub shows you your branches out of sync, you should update your featured branch to synchronize with the main repository. For that, make sure that you currently have your feature branch checked out with git checkout feature branch, where feature branch is the name of your branch. Then, assuming you have the main repository added as your remote called upstream, you can do git pull upstream master to fetch and merge with the upstream master branch. If there are any conflicts, you need to resolve them now. Then, once the merge is complete, you can push it, uh, your feature branch to your fork, so the origin re uh, remote, with git push origin feature branch. If you have a pull request based on your feature branch, the pull request will be updated automatically. The last thing I want to mention is a common but easy to avoid mistake when getting started with the GitHub workflow. So if you have followed the other videos, you know how to fork and uh, pull a repo, create a branch, and make a first pull request. Then it usually takes a while for your contribution to be reviewed, and you might want to start on your next issue. Remember that right now your folder reflects the content of your pull request. If you want to start on something else, make sure your base is on the current master branch, not on your pull request. So, Check out your, the master branch and git pull upstream master to have the current version of the master branch. Then create a new branch with uh, check, git checkout b from the master branch, not from your feature branch. And uh, just to be sure, whenever you create a new pull request, look at the diff that is shown in GitHub and check if it includes any changes that it, you didn't mean to include. If you find you have more changes than expected before creating the PR, you can go back and see if you can fix your branch. If you, can, if you, um, if you don't notice at first, you can still undo any changes and update your pull request by pushing to the branch again. One relatively easy way to rewrite your history is um, to do git reset dash dash soft upstream master. This will undo all of your commits, but it will keep the files um, as they are. So basically your history will roll back to the state of upstream master, but all your files will be um, however you change them. From there you can selectively commit all the changes you want to commit while leaving out anything that you don't want to include. Then pushing again um, to your feature branch, potentially you need to force push, um, you can update your pull request. That's all I had for the upcoming sprint. There are many other libraries that could use your help though, and the Data Umbrella has curated a video series of how to contribute to several Python projects, including NumPy, Pandas, and Core Python. Like Scikit-Learn, these are fairly big and established projects. If you're a seasoned developer, contributing to such a project can be very gratifying, so please go and check out his videos. However, getting a change accepted in a mature project can sometimes be challenging, and you can also look for smaller or newer projects that are less established. New projects are often easier to contribute to, and they're usually very enthusiastic if they get outside contributions. They might also provide more of an opportunity for you to collaborate in shaping the vision of the project. So make sure to check out small projects that you are using or interested in and see if they are looking for contributors or ask if you are unsure. There's often lots of interesting work to do and it's a great way to get involved with open source. That's it and I hope I'll see you at the sprint.